I'm Sandeep Goel, one of the EPs at Piedmont uh, Healthcare in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, one of the questions we are talking about, you know, why, why is BFA important uh, despite, you know, looking at, uh, you know, similar level of success compared to radio frequency or cryoablation. And, and I think this case illustrates that point very nicely. So my disclosures are, uh, you know, I'm a consultant for uh, Medtronic and Biosense Webster. And uh, the case that we will be talking about, uh, we have a 54-year-old man who uh, is quite healthy, who has a Chad's West score of zero, has paroxysmal uh, symptomatic atrial fibrillation, and uh, was initially treated with flecainide and beta blocker therapy and continued to have recurrent atrial fibrillation. This was last year in June, and it's a, it's a real case. So, so he uh, actually underwent an ablation uh, last year, and when we did the electrical mapping, uh, we found that he has a very healthy left atrium, uh, as expected, but we actually did not complete the ablation procedure, and the reason for that was uh, when we tested, so that one of the things we think about is collateral damage with thermal ablation, where you can have injury to adjacent structures like esophagus and phrenic nerve. When we are looking at a young, healthy patient, safety becomes critically important. So we test in the thermal world, we will test for proximity to phrenic and monitor esophageal temperature. You know, in this patient, uh, the esophagus was actually quite close to, um, I don't know if the pointer is visible, quite close to the left veins, and we had significant temperature rises as soon as we applied any lesions, and that would lead to increased risk of AE fistula. And when I tested his phrenic nerve, unfortunately, that was also quite close. This is a schematic that looks at the right phrenic nerve that often runs anterior to the right superior pulmonary vein, and we had sort of very heavy stimulation every time we, we tested that area. Given the PFA was on the horizon, I did not want to put him through the risk of injury to two critical structures, so we stopped and, uh, and moved along. So he continued to have AFib. We tried a different drug. We moved to Sotolol. He still continued to have some degree of atrial fibrillation and was fatigued on Sotolol. So about six weeks ago, he came back for his uh, repeat attempt with the ferropulse catheter that, you, uh, that has been sort of already mentioned. So, you know, this is actually uh, some of the images from uh, his case, and as you can see, the catheter is sitting in the left upper pulmonary vein, and, you know, the top uh, pictures look at the basket configuration, and then the bottom one look at the flower configuration. Just to go back, you know, this catheter can be modified just with the handle, the shape can change. So that's kind of a unique feature, and it allows a lot of versatility compared to some of the previous technologies. This is actually an intracardiac echo image from his case. On the left side, that um, it's into the what we call the flower configuration, and that's the right superior pulmonary vein. And on the right side, it's the same, same patient, but a different vein, the left uh, superior pulmonary vein, where we have a picture of the basket uh, catheter through the intracardiac echo. Um, this is Dr. Gernsfeld has already shown that, uh, you know, when you deliver lesions, the signals disappear very quickly. So this is actually a recording of his whole case. And you can see uh, this is the left upper pulmonary vein. I'm changing sort of the catheter shape and orientation. And we are able to, uh, you know, it's fast forwarded a little bit, but, uh, but it is still quite rapid that we can move from vein to vein. And, and deliver lesions. Every time you see the catheter has a big jump, that's when the energy is being delivered. And so we were able to actually go through all of his four pulmonary veins. We didn't have to test proximity to esophagus. We didn't have to test phrenic nerve. And we were able to be done yeah. in probably about 30 minutes. And, and that is a huge, huge, huge factor. You know, I was not sure, honestly, as in, uh, someone who used mapping, didn't use fluoroscopy, if I would use this technology. But the level of stress, I think if somebody could measure my adrenaline level in an <laughs> RF case versus this case, it would be significantly lower. It's actually, I'm, I've never done cryo, so I was going to be late adopter, but I have not done a single radio frequency AF case since uh, 
we have had access to pulse field ablation. So it's a big, big, big change. I think, uh, and one of the things I'd point out, this patient went into atrial flutter. One thing we can do with this technology in the current form is still atrial flutter ablation. We use radio frequency because it can cause coronary spasm. So, you know, he's done well. Just for the sake of time, I'll stop on a final point. I think the biggest advantage the pulse field may bring is that we will be able to treat these patients earlier. I think one of the big challenges in AF is that we wait too long to treat these patients. And one of the reasons we, uh, at least I was still hesitant to offer first line AF ablation to everyone was because if you have a fistula, you're pretty much dead. And you know, th that's not really an acceptable complication for a non-life threatening disease. And I think here eliminating that complication really, really significantly will allow us to treat these patients earlier in their disease course. Thank you. Great. Thank you.